Okay guys, welcome back to another video tutorial with me, Dr. Octobeard, your one-stop shop for top-notch knowledge. Not a guarantee. This time I'm looking at the OCR Creative iMedia course and the digital video unit. So let's get stuck in. Mom, I am stuck! Like most units on this course, creating a digital video sequence is broken down into four sections or learning outcomes. Theory, planning, making, and evaluation. In this video, I'm going to look at the theory. OCR won't let me do videos on the specific planning, making, and evaluation sections of your coursework, and they ain't budging, no matter how much I beg them. She gotta help me out here, please. They're gonna take my dumbs. So in this video, I will be covering the sectors and uses for digital video, the different file formats, and the properties of digital video. If you want a top grade for sectors, Not a guarantee. the MARC scheme says you need to identify a wide range of sectors in which digital video is used, which demonstrates a thorough understanding. So what I'm going to do is go through the different sectors, pull out a couple of different uses for each one, and then evaluate them against each other. So the first sector I'm going to look at is the corporate or business sector. These videos are the least familiar to the general public, as they're not intended for mass consumption. They are often aimed at employees or investors in the company. They try to carry the corporate message or values. And there are different types, like this video by Apple. This is an example of an About Us video. It aims to tell new employers or investors what the company believes it is all about. In this case, the colours and clean edges promote a high-end tech company that wants to stand out from the crowd. It is filmed in a studio and there are a lot of visual effects applied after the edit. This sort of corporate video is very different from a product demo, like this one from Microsoft. Product demos often go along with the launch of a new product or line and try to show off what the product can do. Again, they are aimed at people who work in the industry and are as much about showing off as teaching people about your new product. Product demos tend to be filmed at business conferences and to have fewer cuts and less post-production. What you're seeing here is what the people at the conference would actually see on the big screen. Another sector that uses digital video is the commercial sector. One example of this is advertising. Of course, a perfume advert is going to look very different from a ketchup advert, and filming them would require quite different planning. But their general aim is the same and they tend to have a familiar look that involves lots of cuts, interesting camera decisions, and creates the sort of narrative, story style that we are familiar with from films. It is very different from something like a public information announcement. If you or anyone in your household has a high temperature, here the camera is still, and there is no slick editing or big budget, and it feels more like a newscast than an advert. The sector that we are probably the most familiar with is entertainment, which includes television. You've got to be really, really quiet. Music video. So if we went off in hats, then it was spoken properly. And film. When I call you, you must come. But even within the film sector, different sorts of films require different sorts of setups. Take a film like 1917. We will lose 1,600 men. This historical drama is trying to create the illusion of one continuous take, through lots of careful planning and hidden cuts. This would be very different to a superhero film like Avengers Endgame, where the scenes would be matted, filmed on green screen, and then composited with other footage, both real and digital. Shooting with digital doubles, like the kind that is done in video games, requires a very different setup from most other media. Here it's all about the sensors and capturing the facial acting, as what is eventually moved by these sensors could be anything at all. Planning for this sort of video entertainment would be very different from planning for a low-budget film like Kiddletud, with its gritty, urban look and feel. Finally, there are online applications for digital video sequences. Setting up to record a screen for a software how-to tutorial is different from setting up a camera to record yourself for a makeup tutorial. 
even though the end goal might be the same. And you can write about any of these sectors and research your own examples by typing in the terms that I searched. Video file formats are next. These are the little letters after the video file name that tells you how it was encoded, and so some of the things that you can and can't do with it. Most of us export videos out on whatever the default or last settings were, or whatever our teacher told us to use. But the thing about this course is that it's designed to make you an expert. So when you're working in the industry and someone says, I need to create these little animations for viewing on a mobile phone, you can say, you want SWF or FLV or whatever. So what are those things? There are pretty much five file formats that you need to know about on this course. But let's start at the top with codec and compression. Have you ever noticed how when you take raw video files off a camera, it sometimes takes up a lot of space on your hard drive? That's to do with how much the video has been compressed. It tends to work on a sliding scale. The more you compress a video, the smaller the final file size is. Small file sizes mean faster downloads and smoother streaming, but a lot of compression can affect the picture quality. In the race to balance quality and speed, different ways of coding and decoding videos were created. These are called codecs. See what they did there? AVI stands for Audio Video Interleave. It was incredibly popular in the early 2000s, and there are still lots of AVIs knocking around on the internet, which is why you might need to work with it one day. In 2003, Microsoft started to replace AVI with WMV, Windows Media Video. This was designed to give smoother video for streaming. However, the inability to manually change the aspect ratio in both WMV and AVI meant that the video sometimes just wouldn't play right on your screen. MOVs were developed specifically for encoding movies. They stored information on multiple tracks, much like the way modern digital video is edited. This had the advantage of being able to store video, audio, and things like subtitle text in the same file, meaning that advances in one of these areas, like 5.1 surround sound, would mean that the MOV format did not instantly go out of date. FLV are flash video formats. These are great for playing files over the internet as they create very small file sizes when exporting. SWF, or shockwave flash files, are a popular form of flash video. Their reliance on vector graphics means that they retain image quality and scale in better size than other formats. However, flash video files are not supported by Apple devices like iPhones and iPads. IPhone, iPad, iPhone, iPad. Finally, there is MP4 or MPEG4. This is an incredibly popular format as it generates small file sizes, but still has a decent general quality. It is an international format that runs on just about every device and is capable of storing video, audio, text, and pictures. Ever wonder how they fit that album cover in your MP3 downloads or streams? Because MPEG supports images. If you want to know more about these file formats, and you absolutely should do this, you can type something like AVI versus MOV into any search browser and find out about the tiny technical details that make these codecs different from one another. Finally, we move on to the properties of digital video. We've already talked a little bit about aspect ratio. It refers to how wide and tall the image is on the screen. Old time TV had an aspect ratio of 4x3, which is why you sometimes get the black bars at the side of old TV broadcasts. The human eye works in something close to 16 to 9, which is widescreen. Most modern TV is broadcast in this aspect ratio. More modern issues with aspect ratio can occur when filming with mobile phones. The default is still 16x9, but some people film in portrait, meaning the video is 9 by 16. A common way of dealing with this involves placing a blurry background layer behind the main image and expanding it. Knowing what format the video was filmed in is really important when it comes to editing it, as the wrong format can mean that you're either cutting video off at the sides, or you're getting black bars. So many black bars. It can also be important to know about different video formats when exporting out. Before we lived in a globalised world, people did things in the way that worked best for them. It's why we drive on the left in some countries and on the right in others. 
They have roundabouts. Apparently these are very effective, roundabouts. but you have to know how to use them for them to be effective, and I don't know how to use them. It's the same for TV and video broadcasting. When TV first started getting going, there were two main formats, NTSC and PAL. NTSC was adopted by America, Japan, and a few other places. PAL was adopted by Europe and most of Asia, Australia. The reasons for the differences go back to the way electricity reaches the homes of people living in those countries. In America, the power runs at 60 hertz. In Europe, it's 50 hertz. Video is made up of a sequence of still images all run together to create the illusion of movement. In America, there are 30 of these images, or frames, in every second. In the UK, it's 25 frames per second. This is exactly half the hertz rate of the electricity reaching the TVs. The frames that make up video are made up of horizontal lines called fields. In any given frame, the image would show either the odd-numbered fields or the even-numbered fields. There would be hundreds of fields on screen at any one time, and they would be very small, so the human eye would find it very difficult to tell whether the odd or even lines were showing. It would just look like a complete picture, though it might be flickering a bit. PAL actually stands for Phased Alternating Line. Because American TVs used 525 fields displaying 30 still images, or frames per second, and UK TVs used 625 fields displaying 25 frames per second, there was just no way to show US signals on UK TVs. They had to be converted first by a broadcaster like the BBC. Modern high definition, or HD, screens still use this interlaced system. It's what the I in 1080i stands for. But they also use a progressive system. Instead of only showing half the fields in each frame, progressive scans allow you to show all the fields, which leads to a much sharper picture though also leads to increased file sizes and requires more bandwidth when being broadcast. All modern HD video is broadcast in 30 frames per second. The quality of the picture is determined by its resolution, or pixel size. As a video is made up of images, the quality of these images will determine the quality of the video. Raster images are made up of pixels, tiny dots of color that, when you put them all together, make up the picture. The more pixels you have, the sharper the picture. 720 is considered the lowest number of pixels required for HD. 720 means that the image is made up of 720 vertical dots by 1280 horizontal dots. 1080 is 1080 up by 1920 wide. Ultra HD formats begin at 4K, and even 5K resolutions are becoming more commonplace as technology improves. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, not all video is filmed in 5K, but it can be upscaled. However, we've all seen what happens to an image with a small number of pixels when it's blown up bigger than it can handle, which is why knowing what format your final video needs to be in is so important before you begin filming. I hope you've enjoyed this video on creating a digital video sequence. Do please get in touch in the comments section if you have anything you'd like to ask, or if you have an idea for another Dr. Octobeard video. Thanks for watching.